Welcome back everyone to the second video of the Getting Familiar series which covers concrete foundations and their corresponding drain mechanisms. Now when looking at this vital phase of construction it makes things a lot easier if you break it down into its main components, their respective objectives and the sensible methodology used to achieve these requirements. Now we commence this talk with the topic's main function which entails setting the home on a sturdy fixed base. Now I say fixed because the ground has a tendency to shift and settle, which of course gives way to potentially harmful movement of the home's positioning. And one of the ways to avert this as previously explained in the excavation video is to get below the frost level. Now the interesting thing about digging deeper to mitigate the frost human effects on the foundation is that you're simultaneously hitting tougher ground. So in the just of things, concrete walls essentially function as a durable intermediary, transferring the tough base condition up to less water-friendly materials that can then commence above the ground. Now, I'll talk more about how this cooperation between concrete and less enduring items like wood and clay prevents extensive wear on most of the home from common environmental products like water, but for the moment I want to focus on the main components that allow foundations to meet this demand. So at the bottom or base of most foundation walls, you have what is called a footing. And the main purpose of this component is to distribute the weight of the home over a larger area so the pressure on any given spot is decreased. The result of this, of course, is a lower load-bearing requirement from the soil, which makes most material you come across underground suitable at higher depths. In entirety, then, footings act much like their name suggests, that is, as a stabilizing mechanism of the overall structure. Now the footings range in sizes, however most homes typically require a minimum 6 inch thick footing for a standard 10 inch wall that is approximately 2 feet wide. Now when looking at the inside of the footing, you have reinforcement steel or bar which is commonly just referred to as rebar for short, running lengthways and equal distance apart and approximately 3 inches from any surface of the concrete. This material contributes to the structural rigidity of the concrete via its role as a tying mechanism, so it basically secures the concrete to a higher degree and also anchors in distinct parts of the foundation. So, if we bridge this to our walls, the forming crew will insert these shoe-like vertical rebar pieces at four foot intervals on center before once the concrete has been poured to establish continuity between the two units. These vertical rebar pieces will then be joined by longer rebar units that extend the full height of the wall and then cross tie with horizontal rebar pieces all via wire tie. Once the concrete has been poured and is setting up, similar pieces we had at the bottom in the footing will extrude through the top of the wall allowing the wood sill to be anchored into the foundation using washer and bolts. Okay, so rebar is a construction material used to reinforce concrete and secure with other components of the foundation and house. Around the time the foundation is becoming reinforced, incidentals usually made from either wood, rigid foam or PVC are inserted to allow voids for the subsequent materials such as windows, beam pockets, pipes and ledges. Ledges for the exterior materials become particularly important because they can allow a higher situated first floor without exposing too much bland concrete on the exterior. Essentially, code makes it mandatory for a minimum 6 inches of the concrete to extend above the ground, ensuring no somewhat less stout material such as wood or clay comes into contact with the moisture of the soil. Given the average basement wall is around 8 feet, depending on how deep your excavation is, you can easily have a finished first floor 4 feet above grade, which may be particularly desirable for people who enjoy multiple risers in the front of their home. The ledge essentially allows a brick veneer finish, for instance, to still remain situated fairly low to the grade from an exterior point of view because the shelf positions it below the full height of the wall. So what we're arriving at is, concrete basements can be tailored using incidentals and proper planning for not only structural reasons, that is, you know, beam pockets for point loads, but also aesthetic purposes like the exterior finish. Now, in regards to the process on an average modern home, all the aforementioned items take around 10 days to form and pour. Concrete strength is measured in megapascals with different requirements for different applications. That is 32 MPa for garage floors and exterior flat work which take on a lot more volume changes and weather fluctuations and 15 MPa for most other applications. In the case of basements, 20 MPa is a minimum code requirement for the standard 10 inch walls. 
The volume of this material is measured in meters cubed, which can easily be calculated like most perimeter material by either using the gross floor area minus net floor area or the principle of center line measurement for gross floor area less net floor area on a foundation that is 25 by 20 feet. You would subtract the area enclosed by the inner side of the exterior walls from the overall area enclosed by the structure and this would result in the area you would then multiply by height to get the overall volume you require. Whereas PCF discovers the length of the center line of the perimeter by adjusting the corners, which can then be multiplied by width and the height of the wall to get the sum number. Regardless of the method you choose, it's always wise to round up to the nearest half increment to leave some wiggle room for any type of loss during the pour. When forming a basement, there is also the option of using insulated concrete forms, which are essentially rigid foam forms that permanently remain after the pour is complete, to provide the minimum code basement insulation factor, which is R20 for traditionally formed basements and actually R22 in ICF's case. These are a lot easier to set up owing to their lightweight Lego-like assembly. However, they cost on average 20 to 30% more per square foot owing to their unique set-in-place non-reusable form composition. Irrespective of what type of forming you use to achieve the resulting concrete foundation, the price of this phase of construction typically hovers around the 30,000 to 40,000 range, including the surrounding three quarter inch gravel, perimeter drain, and the air gap membrane used for waterproofing. Alright, so that's it for concrete basements. The last diagram is done rather vaguely because I'm going to be going over waterproofing and perimeter drains in a video to come. But other than that, thank you all for watching and I hope you all enjoyed it.